Hello, and welcome to another episode of Books, Kids, and Creations with Tracy Bloom. I am here today with Aaron Anthony, or Aaron Winnick Anthony. I said it before and I messed it up right away. It's all good. <laughs> she, she is a science communication specialist and um, presently works for the International Space Station. So there is a lot of buzz going on right now in the world about all of the different um, voyages to space. And we have the honor of talking with you today about everything that we don't know about this fantastic career field. So welcome and welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, well, I really want to start off by talking about how you got started in this in this field. So, have did you grow up around science and, and engineering, and how did you how did you find your love for this field? Yeah, I, at its core, my passion is really making things. So, as a kid, I loved everything from sewing my Halloween costumes to making big Lego structures to even video editing movies and writing. Because I think writing is a form of making in and of itself too. So, you know, that's kind of where the core started for me. Um, I did have family members that worked in the space industry too, which of course is a big help. And growing up in Florida, you can step out in your front yard and see rockets taking off. So I grew up in the midst of the shuttle program. So I'm sure some of that influenced it too. Uh, but I actually got my mechanical engineering degree because of that. I really loved that core of making. And even though I knew I had like a passion for writing on the side, like I that that making core, being able to learn to weld and work in a machine shop is kind of what drove that original passion. Yeah, and and so when you started, uh, how long have you been with NASA and with the International Space Station? Just a little over two years now. Okay, cool. Yeah. And so when you, when you started working there, did you have to undergo any kind of special training or what was that like being onboarded with NASA? You know, I have to give a lot of credit to the team that I work with to giving me that optional training. It wasn't like I necessarily had to go through some specific science communication courses or something like that. But, you know, I have I work on a really awesome team of communicators. Um, I'm actually the only one of our like core group of three that has a more technical background. I work with an amazing videographer, um, video editor and um, another woman who is an amazing science communicator with a journalism and teaching background. So, you know, they were fantastic and onboarding me with just teaching me all the acronyms, how all the different programs that the space station uses and all that. It really was a very much learning on the job type of thing. Um, a lot of the training really kind of came up in the years before too, because I use that technical background as well as I worked for a while as a journalist. So kind of combining those two areas and intersecting them is kind of the sweet spot and applying all those skills to NASA. Yeah. And it seems like such a dream job. I mean, when you talk to kids, when they're little and you're like, what do you want to be when you grow up? A lot of them are like astronaut. Yeah. Uh, I feel like there, there's a lot of jobs that are specifically with, you know, um, NASA that people don't really know about. I mean, everyone knows about the astronaut, but what are some of those really exciting jobs that not too many people know about? Yeah, so I'll say at its core, I didn't know my job existed either. So the basically what I do for this is I'm a storyteller for all the science that happens on the space station. So we've had over 3000 experiments that have been done over the two decades that the space station has been up there and people have been living aboard it. And I get to help learn about all these technical things that we're doing in microgravity and how they benefit us back here on Earth and help us explore further into the solar system and then explain that to the general public through feature stories, helping writing video scripts. I run the ISS Research Twitter account, which we passed over a million followers, which is super exciting. So um, that's kind of what I do for my job. But some of the other ones that I get exposed to are all of the scientists who support that research on station. Because to have hundreds of experiments going on at one time, you have a lot of people that are designing these things, launching them up there. People are even specialized in, you know, transporting cold stowage up there to make sure the things that have to stay cold stay that same temperature. Um, we even have people in mission control that are communicating with the astronauts who are running these experiments and sometimes even running the robotics without interacting with those astronauts because a lot of what we do up there is autonomous. You know, we don't actually, the astronauts aren't doing the hands-on stuff for it. Right. So there's so many jobs. And one of the things I also like to emphasize is you don't necessarily need a STEM background to work at NASA. Mm -hmm. We need everyone from accountants to even seamstresses who work on different like sewing things and work on spacesuits. So like you can have virtually any background and find a place working at NASA and in the space industry as a whole. That's awesome. Because, yeah, I mean, you think about NASA and you immediately go, oh, I probably have to know 
every form of algebra and every, you know, this, that, and the other, and I'm not qualified for that, but you don't think about all the other positions that make those, make everything possible. And so I also saw that you have a TikTok channel. I do. Words. I'm such a nerd. Is it a channel? Account, I guess. I don't know, but yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And you show all kinds of really cool science videos and it's no wonder that people go nuts for them because um, there was one that you did where it shows you actually going inside of, um, well, I can just show it, but it's it's just a this is such a cool thing where it's like you get to do things that not many people in their lifetime get to do. And this is just part of your, you know, your day to day. Yeah. You know this here. Um, first commercial airlock on the space station. To get inside, we just slid right into the bottom, being very careful not to touch anything. In just a few days, this will be headed off to Kennedy Space Center to prepare for launch in the trunk of a SpaceX Dragon capsule. This will be in space in just a few months. Today at work, I got to go inside something. Yeah, this was um, the Bishop airlock that I got to go in. So one of the cool things about being a, a communicator is that you get to kind of go and experience some of these things to videotape them or to record interviews with these people yeah. to help share it with the world. So we get to see some of this stuff up close. So this airlock that I was in is now attached to the space station. Oh, cool. um, I even got to sign a piece of it. So my name is on the space station now, which is mind blowing. Um, but this is a, one of the first commercial airlock that was attached to the space station. So we're doing a lot more commercial um, you know, research and different commercial applications in, in low earth orbit. And so it's going to be able to deploy satellites out of it, um, release trash, have different things that are attached to the outside of it to conduct science. So it's very cool to be able to see that stuff just right right up in person. Right. That's amazing. And you also kind of talk about one of the videos on your TikTok is showing practical things that are used in space. And one of the things I thought was really cool was um, some of the astronauts had Velcro strips on their pants because, you know, gravity and they want to put their iPads maybe strapped down to their pants or something like that. I guess we don't really think about like how difficult everyday things are up there. And I guess, you know, with all the things in the news recently of, you know, um, some of the billionaires going to space, is it is space kind of harder then people know it is. I mean, it seems like there's a lot that has to happen for people to be actually comfortable in space. Yeah, and I think it depends on how long you're spending up there. Cause I think some of the the trips that, you know, are being offered through like Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic now are, are pretty short. You know, they're more minutes type thing. Yeah. But when you're up there for days, weeks, months, up to a year, Yes, it does put a lot of stress on your body. And honestly, that's one of the things that we're really studying on the space station is analyzing the astronauts that are up there. They're some of the test subjects to help us learn and how we can help counteract some of these things. For example, um, a lot of astronauts have encountered vision changes in space that we weren't expecting. Hmm. It's um, called SANS, Space Associated Neuroocular Syndrome. Um, So basically, the eye shape kind of changes and astronauts can get a little bit blurrier vision. And when they come back to earth, they can see some of those changes too. And we're still figuring out exactly why, who it affects um, and the different causes of that. So we didn't know that until people started going to the space station, we got continuous data and and seeing about those effects. So yeah, and astronauts have to work out for over two hours a day to maintain their bone and muscle um, masses. So there's a lot of ways that we can counteract and have people to stay healthy, but it is a lot of work and you have to know the right things to be able to do. It's kind of like an extreme prolonged camping trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and again, it wouldn't be possible without all the people on the ground yeah. constantly doing their best work too. Exactly. Yeah. And something else I saw that you do, aside from just this amazing work with NASA, you also do a lot of um, making and uh, 3D printing. You do fashion work. Talk about how you kind of got into, I saw you do... Um, space fashion. I think that's incredible. And it should be, I feel like there should be like a whole fashion show of space <laughs> yes. fashion. <laughs> Talk I agree. About that a little bit. Yeah. So I originally started getting into space fashion. I had a company for about five years that I ran called SciChic that made three printed science and engineering inspired fashion. Um, the original way I started like going into fashion was sewing my Halloween costumes, as I mentioned, but you know, found that intersection was 
I really wanted to be able to make some creative and fun things with my 3D printer and thought this would be a cool way to be able to inspire people to experience space and science in a new and tangible way. Um, sometimes being have, have something they can interact with and just see in their own two hands that is design that's inspired by space gives them something they can connect to in a unique way and can be a really cool conversation starter. So I started accumulating a large closet full of space fashion during this time, going to different events. And I, I really try to encourage people to think beyond the, you know, just the nerdy t-shirts, which are awesome, right. but also there's a whole other genre of this, of people that run businesses making absolutely gorgeous patterned dresses and things that are inspired by space imagery or have different patterns that they've created inspired by those things. So yeah, I, I absolutely love wearing it. I still make some myself, even though I don't sell it anymore. Um, I have a partnership with a group, a, a woman called Startorialist. Um, and they run a science fashion shop that sells a few of my designs still, but very cool. I, my most popular one that went viral this past year was, um, if you were familiar with the Perseverance rover that landed on Mars, mm -hmm. uh, its parachute had a very cool pattern on it that I turned into a pattern for a circle skirt and yeah. also a pattern that I put on a jacket. So that one got a lot of attention and was a ton of fun. I've seen those popping up all around. <laughs> does a certain Mythbusters host happen to have one of those? She yes. does, yes. I thought I saw that. Okay, that's awesome. And you also do a lot of work with 3D printing, uh, mm -hmm. 3D jewelry. I saw that you made your own bridal bouquet. I did. Which is, I mean, who does that? What bride does it? That's awesome. Like. What all have you done with 3D printing and how did you get into that? Yeah, so I started getting into 3D printing while I was in college studying mechanical engineering. It was a, a fun thing that I could be able to, I, I have my own 3D printers and just be able to do in my dorm room rather than having to go into a machine shop and make stuff. Yeah. Um, I think my wedding is probably the, some of the funnest things I've printed. So for my wedding, I 3D printed my bouquet, which was all the individual flowers. And then I kind of did a floral arrangement. It was pretty heavy, so I did not throw it, which is everyone's first question. Um, <laughs> I still have it. <laughs> and then I printed all my bridesmaids bouquet uh, I printed my table numbers um, and my cake decorations, my cake toppers, which were large uh, forms of Lego mini figs. Um, and then uh, I also 3D printed my headband and a necklace for the flower girl. So it was a very big project and a ton of fun. Um, I've also done a ton of real random things ranging from Christmas tree toppers to um, different name tags and just decor and things from around my house. Um, and now that I, I've moved recently, I'm setting up a whole new little maker space for myself. So hope to have a lot more coming soon. Yeah. And it seems like, so when you're in your ideal element, it's definitely involving some kind of science, some kind of making. Um, do you dabble with anything other than that? Do you dabble with like um, writing or, um, you know, anything that we don't know about? Yeah, I, I'd say the two biggest ones are sewing and writing. So sewing kind of falls into that fashion design area that I love to do. I make some cosplay costumes. I made costumes. I made a Miss Frizzle costume that you know makes a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, I do a lot of writing in my free time too. In addition to in my regular job, so part of what I do at, at work is help edit and write a lot of the feature stories that NASA publishes about International Space Station research which is very much on the, the non-fiction side of things. And then um, in the more fiction side, I'm actually uh, finishing up a middle grade kids book right now that I'm co-writing with my husband. He's a full-time author, sci-fi fantasy author. His name is Alex, he writes under Alex Knight, K-N-I-G-A-H-T, K-N-I-G-H-T. Um, <laughs> and uh, speaking of not being able to say names, um, but uh, so we've been co-writing that together and it's been a ton of fun to kind of combine the fantasy sci-fi element and my science background to make a middle grade book. So right. that's been an amazing project and uh, hope to do more of that in the future too. Yeah, what a hit that's gonna be. I mean, with all the knowledge that you have from a science perspective, I'm sure that you guys can just meld that all together and make something fantastic and educational for kids. Yeah, and I'll add too, if you wanna combine the 3D printing, I actually just wrote um, a chapter of a, a women in 3D printing book too that just came out. It's on the oh. more academic side, published by Springer Publishers, but just the over the past couple of weeks um, that came out, uh, it's called Women in 3D Printing and my chapter is like 10 pages or so in it. So that was a fun kind of dabbling in another area because I've had this, you know, more journalism side that I've written for. I've had the more you know fiction side. And this was the kind of academic side. So it's been, I really enjoy going and trying out all those different types of writing as well. Yeah. And 
As far as some of the things that you've covered um, with your job, what are some of the most exciting things for you? Is there something that you think is just a fantastic find or a read that you've uncovered through your work? Yeah, so some of my favorite things to read, in addition to just stuff that NASA, NASA publishes as a whole, uh, one of the things that um, we've been working on a lot recently is uh, the Benefits for Humanity of Space Station. It's a Benefits for Humanity publication. It comes out every few years. I'm helping work on the next edition, but I've been doing a ton of back reading on the other stuff that we've published in the past. I think one of the things that people often think with space station research is, oh, it's just for exploration, you know, helping us explore further. But there's been a ton, a ton of benefits that come back to us here on Earth. And so being able to read about ranging from um, different new technologies for surgery or drugs that have been developed based on protein crystal growth experiments that are, uh, or even like artificial dog and cat blood for use in like animal surgeries and things like that. All of that is stuff that's been assisted and helped with based on space station research. So reading that Benefits for Humanity book was something really cool. And I think something that a lot of people should, should take a look at to get a better understanding of that. Yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, especially with how the planet is shifting with you know global warming and all of these um, new findings and studies that are coming out. It's like, we need all the help we can get to make the planet more sustainable and to make some big changes. So I'm sure yeah. that that's, also, you already have a lot of science there that you've already dug up regarding, you know, how we can give back to planet Earth, too. Yeah, for sure. It's it's pretty cool. There are a lot of climate studies that happen on the space station because of that unique vantage point, 250 miles up, all the cameras and instruments pointing back down. There's some really cool data that they're able to uncover through experiments ranging from, like, the stress levels of plants. So you can see which areas maybe don't have enough water right now or need more water, which can help with mitigating fire threats. So you can see in advance an area that might be more um, susceptible to having a fire catch. Um, or farmers can even see what areas are overwatered or underwatered in their fields, which help us preserve water. So these instruments are providing really cool data, some of it long-term helping us develop climate models and predictions for the future. And some of it's that real-time actionable data that we're using now. Very cool, very cool. And so have you ever gone to space? No, and I hopefully one day I can change that answer, but uh, no, I have not. <laughs> I can say my name has been to space, but not me. <laughs> well, that, that kind of counts. Kinda there counts. you go. And so <laughs> when you when you um, speak with, with, you know, aspiring children who are interested in science and interested in making and engineering, um, do you do you do any kind of outreach or projects or um, workshops with children? Yeah, honestly, a lot of it's been virtual, obviously, the past couple of years and even just talking with things like this. Um, and I did a lot through SciChic about 3D printing related um, outreach and things like that. So for sure. But one of the big things that I, I'd say I, I tell them about, you know, going into science and engineering is that if you are creative and you love making, there's a spot for you. It's not all, you know, the, the hard math and things like that. And that's important. But we need the, the art, artistic people. We need all the different types of creativity in science and engineering. Um, and just to start exploring it and reach out to people who work in the field because more often than not, they are willing to at least shoot you an email back or give you a tour of their lab. You know, if you express interest in what they do and, you know, show genuine like excitement about it, they'll be more than happy to talk to you and just start at an early age. It doesn't matter how young you are. You know, you can find a place in even contributing, doing citizen science and starting with projects and stuff early on. Yeah, that's amazing. And I love that you well, you keep reiterating that it's not just about, you know, like super, super geared towards science and math. Like there's all these mm -hmm. other avenues and and it is a collaborative, a collaborative place to work. And so, yeah. you know, I just think that's really neat because when, when I think of NASA, I'm like, I picture like the underwater, like people in like dive tanks and they're like holding a brick and running underwater. And like, I don't know, like, I don't know why my mind goes there. It's probably not even a thing, but. Well, hey, if you're a diver, we'll take you too at the neutral buoyancy lab right down the street. So, you know, there, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then um, I guess as far as new things that you're working on, do you have anything on the horizon for um, you know, it sounds like you have a lot on your plate already with, you know, books sure. and things and outreach, but what else are you working on? Yeah, so the main things right now are finishing up that book that I was talking about, and then also um, 
trying some new stuff with my TikTok account, um, trying to do some more collaborations and things like that. Um, I'm excited to hopefully once we start going back on, on site at work, we're still working from home, be able to share behind the scenes from a few things and um, really talking about some of the awesome new stuff that we have coming up with, with the space station and my personal account, as well as just fun, uh, you know, space fashion related stuff that I, I love making. I'm doing a, you know, some TikTok lives with some of my other friends, fellow science communicators and um, trying to engage more with that community. So um, TikTok for me is very much a, you know, a fun, well, creative outlet. I don't put pressure on myself to make any content. It's purely whatever I want to make. So not, you know, maybe hitting the algorithm perfect, but um, it's, it's a fun place where you can see just what was on my mind that day. And then also do the stuff that I might've spent a lot more time on to, you know, some larger, more in-depth SciComm projects there. Yeah, and your TikTok page is so informative too. I mean, I went through a, several of your videos, and there's um, there's one where you're sampling food. Yes, for astronauts, and you, I mean, you don't even think about like what astronauts get to eat up there. And uh -huh. I just think that it's, your day to day has to be so exciting for what you're what you're doing. Yeah, and even when you know we're working from home, just being able to read about all the science that's happening on a daily basis up there, having that you know really great familiarity with that. Today, the, the astronauts are working on thinning the pepper crop that is up there. Mm -hmm. So um, the peppers are a longer term cultivation period. So they're going to be grown for a long period of time. But just being like, that's what people are doing in space today. That's pretty cool. Um, right. And just being able to see the live feeds of that, that video that's coming down and just look through the pictures that they've been taking up there. Even at that, you know, level, it's not like, you know, hands on working with them on a daily basis. It's really cool just to know that there's people up there that are doing this every day. Right, right. Because it is like it's like a whole other world up there. And you're like, what are they doing today? And right. You know, and you don't even think about them growing things up there either. So is the cycle of growing a plant different in space than it is down here? Yeah, right now it's a lot of studies to kind of figure that out with specific plants. We've grown a lot of leafy greens up until now. So that has been one of the things that we've studied pretty in depth. Um, we grew radishes this past year too. So kind of expanding out the different types that we're growing to see how individual plants might be affected differently. And then it's a lot of testing on different lighting conditions as well as watering techniques. Because if you think about watering plants, you can't just pour water on it like you do here in your backyard garden. Right. So trying right. to figure out systems to be able to supply that water and not also drown the plants because right. that water kind of like sticks to the roots and can kind of drown them if it's too much there. So scientists are testing out different systems for that, yeah. seeing if different plants grow differently, um, how it might affect the taste. So astronauts get to taste them up there and see what that differences might be. Um, so a lot of it's investing for, you know, deep space exploration when we might not be able to bring all of our food with us. And we need to have that sustainable food supply. Because right now when we're so close to Earth, we continue to send stuff up and back really, you know, relatively easily as you know, things go. Um, but this research, connecting this research so close is preparing us for those moon and Mars trips later on. So neat, so neat. I like, and I saw that there's one astronaut who reads books in space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so there's actually a story time in space program where a number of them do it, but Megan MacArthur, who's up there now, has been really into it. So she's been reading extra books in space, too. <laughs> that's so cool. So if people want to send her books, do you know how they can submit books? Yeah, actually, the Storytime in Space program is run through the ISS National Lab. If you Google that, I believe they have a book submission program. Usually it's shorter books because they have to be able to read it relatively quickly in one sitting. I think um, Emily Calandrelli's book, I think, was the first um, chapter book that was done. Yeah. But there's a lot of picture books. Um, and then these videos are available to students and teachers that can use them in classrooms. And of course, virtually a lot of places have been using those right now. So yeah, there's definitely a way that you can submit and uh, look at that process online. That's amazing. And then I guess for um, for any kid out there who's wanting to um, pursue a career or follow in your footsteps, um, do you have any words of wisdom for, for children or young adults who are interested in, in kind of pursuing this, but they don't know? Um, yeah. Yeah. So for science in general, I'd say, you know, try to find local programs you can get involved in, whether it's your local robotics club or something at a, a museum that's nearby. If not, there's so many amazing resources online too that you can get started at home, even if it's a coding program that all you need is a computer to be able to get started or something a little bit more tangible, some like DIY type stuff. Um, and then if you're interested in actually doing science communication, which is you know kind of a, the other niche, I'd say 
start writing about science, you know, and sharing science with the world. Cause you don't have to be an expert to be able to do that. You just have to learn how to learn and then how to explain that to everyone else. So it's a lot of knowing the right questions to ask and then figuring out the best ways to explain that and just telling your parents about, you know, some cool thing you learned is a great way to get started and see if that's your passion. Yes. That's great words of wisdom. And then if anybody wants to follow you on TikTok, what mm -hmm. is your account for them to I, follow? Yeah, I am at Erin Winnick, uh, W-I-N-I-C-K on all of the social medias on uh, Twitter, Instagram, and uh, and on TikTok. And then if you want to check out um, the more space station stuff, it's um, at ISS underscore research on Twitter. Amazing. And um, I just, I love that all the work that you've done uh, between, you know, working for the space station, also your work with fashion, your work with anything making and um, STEM related. I mean, it just seems like you're, you're in it all and you've explored just about everything that you've found an interest in. So i um, very thrilled to be sharing your work today and talking with you about, about all that you've done and continue to do. So thank you, Erin, for being here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.